Hello everyone, I'm Karen Dumville, your host for today's episode, and today I'm joined by Sachin Mohan, co-founder at Agami, and Vinod S, head of digital public goods and infrastructure at ThoughtWorks India. Together, we'll be exploring the innovative and impactful work behind Jugalbandi, an AI-driven initiative aimed at overcoming language barriers and empowering communities in India. So without further ado, let's dive in. To start us off, can you both introduce yourselves and share a little bit about your roles and how you have worked together? Let's start with you, Sachin. Yes, um, so I am one of the co-founders of an organization called Agami. And Agami is an India-specific organization. Our mission is to bring greater innovation in law and justice. You know, we feel that this is a critical domain, access to justice, legal services, and it hasn't seen as much innovation as it should have. Uh, so uh, we were set up around seven years back with the uh, objective of building an ecosystem of innovators uh, that could ultimately transform how law and justice uh, tra- uh, operates in India. And of course, uh, very quickly, we could see that AI would have an absolutely transformative impact on the law and justice space because it's very rules-based. It's, it's a lot of operations and processes. Uh, so we we felt that building an initiative that could create open, usable AI tools for innovators in law and justice would be vital. And that's how the Open AI mission, uh, for those who uh, struggle with that name, it's Open AI, not Open AI. <laughs> uh, there's a little NY in the middle of Open and AI, which and AI in Hindi means sans, uh, means uh, justice. So uh, open AI is open justice, and you could also say open AI for justice. So that's the mission that uh, you know uh, came out of Agami, and that's a mission through which we have collaborated with the ThoughtWorks from day zero as our technology uh, and data sciences collaborator. Uh, so we've been you know building things uh, as a part of that mission from uh, day zero, which was about three years back. Wonderful, thank you for that, and Vinod. Hi, yeah. So uh, I've been with ThoughtWorks for more than 12 years and at ThoughtWorks I've been uh, responsible for uh, our work in the digital public goods and infrastructure space and, um, you know, in that, um, you know, in that capacity I had the privilege to work with Sachin and his team with Agami as well. Um, and, and what I do find quite interesting in this space is it's almost counterintuitive, but uh, we, en- we end up working with a lot of real cool tech Um, Agami is one case in point, but I've got a lot of other cases also where we've been using Gen AI, we've been using blockchain as well. Um, And and it's it's actually quite interesting because if you have to sort of bridge the digital divide, you Mm -hmm. have to actually adopt even more deep tech. So that's something that I've sort of uh, come to understand. And um, yes, I mean, it's been great to work with uh, Sachin and his team uh, on Jugalbandi and everything else that uh, now Jugalbandi is starting to promote as well. Great. So let's get into some of the details. Um, Sachin, can you explain the concept of Jugalbandi and how it's leveraging AI to address social challenges, particularly in overcoming language barriers? You know, it's uh, so Jugalbandi is one of the open technologies that have come out of the Open AI mission the Open AI for Justice mission that I was talking about. And Jugalbandi is one of the public technologies that has come out of that. So, you know, one of the open source technology stacks that has come out. The intent is to empower innovators. So let me explain, you know, what this does. You know, in India, one of the biggest problems is access. And there are many reasons why people don't access or can't access information, can't access services. But what the studies have found is one of the biggest reasons is that the languages of those services and the information is not the language they speak and understand. And one other thing, not just is the language not the language they speak and understand, because, you know, India is a melting pot of languages. It has so many different languages, you know, that people speak almost every few miles the language changes. Uh, But over and above the language challenge, there's the complexity challenge that the interface of that information or that service is just not clear to them. So it's not just a language challenge, it's a complexity challenge. Now, you know, Karen, the issue is that the language and the complexity makes the whole effort, vitiates the whole effort. Suddenly, 
almost everything becomes inaccessible to 97, 98% of people because of language and complexity. So it doesn't matter how good the design of the scheme is, uh, the government scheme, doesn't matter how good your service is, doesn't matter how compelling the information is. If it's not in the right language, if it's not too complex, person is not getting it. So that is a huge disabler. So the idea of Jugalbandi, and Jugalbandi is a word that means a, a sort of something happening in tandem. Two, like, you know, it comes from Indian classical music, the idea of two musicians operating in tandem, you know. Uh, and uh, here, what's operating in tandem is the language AI, the AI that is the language translation, voice to voice AI, and the Gen AI, which is taking any piece of information and can ask any question to that piece of information and give an answer like you're a five-year-old, a seven-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 12-year-old, a 15-year-old. So think about that combination of the language AI and the Gen AI. So the language AI solves the language problem. The Gen AI solves the complexity problem. Now you put that on top of any domain, any use case, and suddenly you've got accessible housing, accessible justice, accessible health, accessible government schemes. So that's the thing here. The idea behind Jugalbandi was, could Jugalbandi be a public technology that innovators anywhere, inside government, outside government, private industry, can slap on to their systems of information and services and suddenly bridge that massive last mile gap? That makes a lot of sense. And that kind of sets me up for the next question, which is, what specific civic society initiatives has Jugal Bandi been involved in and how has AI been integrated into these projects? Yeah. So, you know, uh, when we started off, uh, the sort of demonstrative use case that we used was government schemes. You know, India has a massive number of government schemes, hundreds of millions of Indians. I would wager between 600 and 800 million Indians uh, which is a huge number, like 60-70% of the country, um, access some form of government scheme or the other. It might even be more, Karen. But at least this many access some or depend on some government scheme or the other. Truth is, they don't, majority of them struggle to get the complete benefits of these schemes or even know about them, right? So one, they don't come to know about them. Two, they cannot participate in them, right? Both the language challenges and the complexity challenges. And we started off by saying, imagine if you're a farmer somewhere speaking your local language and you can talk into your phone and understand, you know, how this thing can benefit you or what can benefit you and how it can benefit you. Maybe it's a scheme to help you build a house, a scheme to protect your property, a scheme to get your daughter educated. Could be anything, right? So we began by showing Jugalbandi as an interface for, say, government schemes. But since then, uh, you know, it's that same point I was making earlier, whether it's accessing legal aid, you know, knowing, uh, you know, asking your questions around uh, some legal issue that you're facing, your family, your property, if could be, could be domestic issue, could be a employment issue. But, uh, or it's uh, something to do with, say, India has a huge migration challenge, which is people are migrating from rural areas to urban areas for, for livelihood. Now, you're not speaking the language of the new place that you're going to. So imagine being able to ask in your own language, you know, where can you get your daughter educated in this new city? Where can you get affordable housing? How can you get a legal aid support there? So the use cases are so many. We as a justice focused organization are particularly excited about the use cases in the law and justice domain. But to, but Karen, it doesn't stop there. It's a public technology that solves the access and complexity challenge, which extends way beyond the justice domain. Amazing. There's no no end to the um, amount of applications for this. Um, yes. What were some of the major challenges you encountered during the development and implementation of Jugalbandi, particularly in terms of addressing linguistic diversity and literacy challenges? I think the first thing is that when we say the language layer, let's assume, Karen, that that complexity challenge, which is a, a large language model asking a, a set of complex information questions and getting simple answers that can be solved quite easily, right? Because today people are familiar with going to chat GPT and saying, explain to me theory of relativity like I'm a five-year-old, <laughs> you know, or explain to me, you know, uh, Pascal's law, whatever. So I think the everyone can understand that complexity, that you can ask complex information, simple questions and get answers. Uh, that is uh, clear. But you know, on the language AI side, on the translation side, uh, the major languages, Karen, sure, Hindi, uh, maybe Bengali, uh, maybe Gujarati, maybe these 
there are very good voice to voice models right and the government of india has a mission called the bhashini mission and bhashini has created open public infrastructure for these languages so it's got all these major languages that they've actually already created the uh, apis for they've already created the infrastructure uh, but you know i think the challenge is that the major languages are always going to be better in their function than the less the more minor languages because there was more data uh, that has been used to train the ai on the major languages and the minor languages the minor as in the maybe beyond the top 5 the quality needs to be continuously worked on uh, and now if the quality is not so great then what happens is the person asking questions can sometimes get frustrated if the quality of the answers that they are getting in their language is not great so i think the major challenge is to continuously improve the quality of the language and the second challenge i would call out um uh, karen is the reality that today access to llms large language models still expensive what's you know the compute is still expensive so what happens is that if you're looking for use cases where millions of people are suddenly going to be using it then who's going to bear those costs non profits could struggle to bear those costs so at some level we have and i know this is not a problem unique to our domain but because we're talking about large social impact use cases this can be an issue so that's the second challenge the challenge of cost uh, and the third challenge i'll say is that look the challenge of classic entrepreneurship how is the person at the ground level going to really use the solution we are imagining them having a simple conversation with their phones but could they even struggle to have that is it that they need human support so do those solutions at the ground level need to actually empower local stakeholders as opposed to trying to replace them a local community worker a local social worker so i think we need to start thinking very creatively of hybrid solutions working with ecosystems of actors that is the difference rather than point and shoot and say ai is going to solve this problem magically think of it as an empowerment for existing ecosystems of actors you know um so i think those are three challenges that we need to be mindful of uh, as we try to apply this makes a lot of sense um and how does jugal bandy ensure cultural sensitivity and accuracy in its ai driven solutions especially when dealing with diverse linguistic and cultural contexts part of this answer karen lies in what we said about the ecosystem approach you see if you're sitting in delhi or you're sitting in bangalore and you're saying here's this solution and the anonymous indian living in chatisgarh or in bengal is going to be able to use this and you know i think you're being naive right the way to look at it is you have to work with entrepreneurs who are more sensitive to their contexts so it is the it is the entrepreneur in bengal who understands that women there uh, who need domestic violence support uh, how can i use this for them how can they talk maybe into their phones uh, using whatsapp and them get simple answers alert their local social workers to challenges uh, but that context sensitivity is coming from that entrepreneur right so this goes back to the beginning that this is public technology karen we cannot be the end innovators the end innovators are the ones who understand contexts and can learn rapidly on the ground how this looks so i think it's important to see this as public technology enabling innovators who have use cases in mind rather than thinking of this as a product or a solution to shoot at from a long distance yes that makes sense and How do you ensure equitable access to tools and services particularly in regions with limited internet connectivity or technological infrastructure? Yeah, this uh, really uh, you know these are the questions these are the fundamental questions of applying AI at scale. Um and I would say it will demand so much creative creativity. I don't think we have all the answers, but I can share with you a couple of thoughts that that we could deep think more about. One is um can we put these tools on ivr so people can call and interact as opposed to maybe using a whatsapp even though the whatsapp penetration is huge even then there are people using not using smartphones uh who may need to call and interact with the system and therefore using ivr systems you know which you, which have been around for a long time which can be connected at the back end to uh, you know the um, the the technology right so one is using ivr uh the other thing is as i said empowering local 
stakeholders as opposed to thinking you're going to get to the per- end person so empower the local because they might be able to get to somebody who's more proficient who's already somewhat of a local change maker how do you empower them to use and the third is technological innovations karen technological innovations like models that one day sit on people's phones so if they don't have connectivity simple uh, in um, Uh, technologies the voice technologies of their language sitting on their phones you know so i think those kind of challenge so you have to innovate at all three levels in a country like india you have to innovate at the community level you have to innovate at the technology level and you have to innovate at the infrastructure level so you know you it's not a it's not a single shot thing um and all it what it does require is just avoiding hubris of technology or techno solutionism and trying to see it as an empowerment capability so karen if i may add here so not so much of the challenge but you know maybe audience uh, outside of india may not appreciate this but the very reason why we adopted whatsapp as a medium of interaction is because a uh, vast number of people in india already use whatsapp they are comfortable using whatsapp and comfortable using whatsapp to send voice messages and listen to voice messages with e- with each other so from an adoption perspective the thought was this is sort of a plus one in a sense i am used to you know dealing with this interact in with this medium and so you know i am putting this um, you know llm and bashni and put that together into a medium which is whatsapp which i as a end user i'm comfortable with and you know that sort of starts at option so 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 why i'm bringing that is you know when when sachin spoke about jugalbandi about voice and gen ai uh, i think there is also this third element of that final absolutely that interaction medium the last mile is what the user is already comfortable with so this is just a plus one as far as their adoption is concerned i think i would i would actually stretch that and say that vinod you pointing out to a third crit- critical aspect of the technology right we spoke about the language ai we spoke about the uh, the gen ai but i think vinod has very correctly said plugging it into something that's already being used by people as opposed to having to package it and separately get adoption you know i think that's the third critical pillar which is appropriate technology really right yes clear and just a lot of complexity on on a lot of different levels uh and a very mm-hmm. broad ecosystem and so looking back you know in hindsight what key lessons have you learned from your experiences with Google Bandy and how do you plan to apply these lessons to future projects and initiatives so this is not the first public technology uh, or public uh, resources in ai and justice that we created but this is definitely the first technology that has really captured public imagination and kind of gone to these very large scale large impact use case implementations you know and uh, there's been a lot of learnings uh, you know karen i think one learning is that um you know you when we when we created this we sort of assumed that people would take it and sort of run with it you know but the capacity to implement these things uh, that capacity is a huge missing gap because you're not dealing with massively technology proficient uh, organizations you know it's not that they are technology illiterate but they're not massively technology proficient i mean today everyone's playing a catch up game you know um so the effort that is required to really connect the dots and support people to implement these capabilities massively underestimated that effort karen and i think that's one learning that we're trying to correct that and we've created now in partnership with microsoft research something called jugalbandi studio which allows for you to just implement a, a bot using our jugalbandi capability in natural language you can literally write down what you want and it creates the bot for you so you know avoiding imp- uh, any sort of need for a technologist to really deploy it for you and those kind of things so we've tried to we're trying to solve that but that's a big learning that there's a gap there and we have to be pay much more attention to implementation that's one gap i think the second gap is that um you know technologies the individual pieces are going to go on becoming redundant very fast as the technologies get better and better so what really is the value i think the value is in creating a combination of things that is relevant for the context the combinations of language and whatsapp and uh, gen ai combined with some privacy filters combined with some uh, help on how you design your prompting all of these little little things that become use case relevant become context relevant that package is where the value is at the combinatorial innovation is where the value is at not 
in the retrieval augmentation uh, system or uh, you know though not in those isolated things alone so i think it's important to stay focused on that that though that's where the real value and the third thing is being better at our ecosystem building i mean we i believe that's a strong point but we we like to say it because we believe that that's where everything is our ecosystem of innovators and stuff i'm sure we know there has more to add there because we've really slogged through this journey together <laughs> so you know do you want to uh, chip in here no sure uh, i think um, one of the learnings and i'm coming from a technology standpoint is one of the learnings is you know sachin spoke about uh, privacy um, data be perhaps hallucinations etc so how do you come up with a framework uh, that can address uh, some of these aspects um, and 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 uh, you know put that in in a way that uh, the solutions that you deploy would be acceptable um, you know for for that context uh, without taking uh, without creating a lot of risks and uh, we came up with this framework called the post crack framework um, which we think can be uh, applied in multiple scenarios uh, not just in the public uh, you know public good space but also in other corporate spaces as well so definitely that has been one huge learning um as as we started working on this like you know sachin said you know it's been a journey uh, we've been on this for the last uh, you know at least 3 uh, years now uh, and and uh, we've learned a lot along the way so i think we've been able to find uh, various uh, you know means to make sure <laughs> things work and we've been able to codify some of that learnings uh, and you know we've been able to create certain patterns and we believe when we pick up uh, another project similar project or another project even in the gen ai space we think we'll be able to bring a lot of those to bear um, as we start executing those hmm. sounds like an incredible amount has been achieved in 3 years um so just switching gears a little bit um we'd love to hear about another significant project you've been involved in the development of ala a specialized ai model aimed at assisting with specific legal tasks in india Can you share a bit more about this project and how it's different from other AI models and how it's been beneficial for legal professionals in their day-to-day activities? So, on a lighter, maybe more musical note, I must show you a little connection between Jugal Bandi and Alap. Jugal Bandi is when two musicians, uh, specifically in Indian classical music, uh, jam together. Alap is when a musician improvises. on a particular type of music <laughs> that's the that's the meaning of ala while jugal bandi is named jugal bandi because the language ai is j- doing jugal bandi with the uh, gen ai ala is uh, uh, is allows the lawyer or the legally minded paralegal to improvise improve their work right that's why the origin of the name and ala stands for ai uh, assistant for legal and paralegal functions so ala Ad alap is a, a bit of a demonstration karen uh, because you see uh, right now one of the amazing things about gpt and especially gpt4 is that it's really proficient at even legal text uh you know it will do summaries it will extract timelines of data from facts it will do a bunch of stuff right it is uh because it's trained on such a large body of general text which includes some 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 amount of legal text right significant amount of legal text so uh, but then gpt4 is um expensive uh and uh, it is not custom uh, made for uh, legal functions and i think what the world is discovering is you can have less expensive models uh maybe even open models that can be fine tuned for legal function and that is a huge possibility uh that you could that that model won't be relevant for something else but it could be fine tuned for legal function so here uh with alap we wanted to demonstrate that we wanted to take a model much smaller model in this case mistral and i think vinod can correct me but it's but i think 7 billion parameters you know much smaller than uh, uh, uh gpt uh and uh, an open model and uh, can you bring to it a set of legal data which we did we collaborated with a bunch of organizations uh, god bless them uh, who gave us data and fine tuned it to show that for certain legal tasks like argument generation uh, analysis um timeline creation it could perform decently uh you know compared to its start point compared to where it would be without any tuning uh so that's the, that was the objective because what were we trying to say karen not to say that here's something out of the box and you can use it no but saying that if you continue down this path 
you can take an open model, a much smaller model, and actually bring data to it and fine tune it and create a professional aid or a paralegal aid of pretty decent standards. So let's continue this journey. That's the message we're singing, uh, stating with Alap. So when we published the paper and the data sets and everything, that was the intent behind Alap to show that something like this is possible. Now, how much we build on top of that? Do we put out another version of this and take it to a higher level of accuracy? Karen, that's something we have to strategically think about. Um, but that was the intent of this first iteration of Alap. And uh, Vinod, please, there must be technical aspects that you, you're dying to uh, color in. Uh, yeah, sure. No, no, not so much technical aspects, uh, but Karen, what we definitely are seeing is uh, while we've got generic large language models uh, out there, um, there are different organizations who are trying to create very domain specific uh, you know, models as well. For example, Bloomberg is creating something which is very focused on the finance field, etc. Um, but like how Sachin alluded to earlier as well, um, using these models are very expensive. Um, you know, using a generic model to do everything that you want. It's perhaps more expensive to keep using those models. Uh, we, we think it's very productive, but then if everyone starts using large language models, I don't think it's going to be really good for the world. Um, so, so it's going to be imperative that we start figuring out uh, models that are much smaller in footprint uh, that can actually uh, reside even in a you know mobile device, for example, and then start uh, you know using those. Um, and and uh, Alap perhaps is one such endeavor uh, in the legal space. Of course, we've used Mistral. Um, uh, if you, if you get to keep working on that, we can see how that can be refined and how that model can become even smaller in terms of footprint, um, so that it becomes uh, far more uh, effective for us to start using this. Uh, what we see is across the board, uh, many organizations, some of our customers are also starting to. Uh, refine models, fine-tune models with the idea of making them smaller and more efficient uh, yeah. so that their compute, their power, the electricity, all of that starts getting uh, much more affordable for what is what is uh, required. You see, when you're looking at some sensitive use cases, like for instance, certain kind of legal system deployment, um, you know, you also want to consider a model that you could potentially put inside your organization, not necessarily use an API to a general model. So that's another dimension here that what is it, what is possible to also literally implement inside your own organization. And that's where the open models fine tuned to your data or to contact domain relevant data becomes so important. Very good. So then talking beyond government programs and schemes, in what other areas do you see potential applications for Jugal Bandi and Arlap's AI driven solutions, both within India and globally? See, with the Jugalbandi, practically anybody who has a language and complexity challenge to solve and who wants to do it using open technology, you know, that's a very large uh, cut, right? Think about it. Like, you know, I was recently in Spain and a large chunk of Spain speaks Euskara, the language of the Basques, uh, of the Basque region. And uh, so many, there are so many migrants in Europe who don't speak that particular language. Imagine in Germany, there are a whole bunch of migrants who don't speak German. So the, I think this language and complexity challenge is so profound that uh, Jugalbandi, a a technology like Jugalbandi, and hopefully many more, Karen, not just Jugalbandi, because we are a public mission for us. It's more important that possibilities become realized rather than only Jugalbandi gets used. Hopefully people take it, improve it. Uh, you know, that's what combinatorial intelligence is. But with Jugalbandi, there's really no limit in that sense, you know, because uh, that's the significance of what is being attempted here. Correct. Um, and I'm also really keen to see it trigger the creation of custom language models for smaller languages. Imagine a tribal language. Imagine a language of aborigine, uh, aborigine communities in Australia are able to actually create a language model and suddenly, you know, you have so much more pride and intimacy with whatever you're interacting with. So this can unleash something because think about it few years back we thought the world was moving towards greater uniformity you got to learn the same languages to really make it but what if we could flip it what if we say that the world is actually moving towards radical diversity that i think is really exciting right uh, i think on alap uh, we think that uh, you know if mo- tools like alap could empower local lawyers so much more 
empower paralegals so much more, maybe make citizens feel like paralegals. And just that overall empowerment is a form of decolonization, Karen. Because at the end of the day, all the intermediaries and systems like lawyers and accountants and all, they pride themselves in speaking a certain <laughs> complicated code of words and language. But if you can empower people, I think it's good for everybody. It's good for the lawyers, it's good for the citizens. So I think seeing more tools like that come out into the domain is going to be really exciting. And this applies to every any common law country, you know, Australia, the UK, Canada, because uh, ALAP will be fine-tuned on common law, uh, the Indian legal documents, but essentially with the strong common law connection. So I think just you showing how ALAP is done and what it's capable of allows many other innovators to build on top and say, hey, we should do this. So we're kind of excited about its triggering effect as a catalyst, catalyst to other public technology creators, you know. In fact, we'd love to see more people who say, I'd like to create a custom model in law. What, what can I learn from the approach you took? You know, uh, so that's that's how how we're thinking about. It. And the last thing I'll say is uh, our collaborators on the mission, people like uh, organizations like ThoughtWorks, the 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 uh, learnings they've had on how to go about doing this, being that itself being a, a tremendous leap, where they then take those learnings out to other uh, you know kind of public minded operators. Indeed, and I'm sure Vinon can probably speak more to that. Yes. So, Karen, um, not many know, but, uh, you know, we've taken Jugalbandi. We have tried to create a version of that called Jignyasa within ThoughtWorks, um, where, uh, you know, then we could, I mean, it's it's still in the works in terms of getting deployed, but I already have some pilots running. So the idea is very similar to, you know, talk to your documents. So if you are working on certain RFPs, if they're very large documents that uh, we need to query and then get answers for, etc. So... I mean, ThoughtWorks is a corporate organization. So, you know, you've got one real use case right there. We're trying to see how we can adopt, uh, you know, Jugalbandi's open open source stack and then use that for our internal purposes. So that's number one. We are very closely working with another large financial organization where uh, we are setting up something similar within their internal setup where, um, you know, you could, you could use similar stacks for their product engineers and other folks to... Um, you know, query the system given a lot of, uh, you know, information and data and then get precise information. We're also taking that forward to see how, if you were to share code into that system, how that can come back and start giving us uh, responses in terms of, you know, what's wrong with the code, what other unit tests or, you know, uh, automated tests can be added to it and so on and so forth. So the uh, opportunities are immense. So that is number one. Number two is uh, user interaction. I think we are setting the stage for um, voice first mediums of interaction, you know, and I think there is a large demography out there um, who would really take corporate services if you start interacting with them just basis voice. Um, and I, I know of several organizations who are sort of taking that uh, uh, you know approach where, you know, I query, I need to make a payment, I need to make a search. I'm not using keyboards at all. I just use my voice and my you know my my site my site to be able to do all of that so i think that's going to create a plethora of new uh, organizations new ways of uh, you know reaching out to customers and hence uh, new opportunities for co- corporates as well hmm. no end to the number of applications i'm sure your minds are just constantly whirring with <laughs> ideas uh, additionally, how do you foresee tech advancements such as integrating large language models shaping the future of conversational AI platforms? There's just the work we've, we've done is only one, uh, a drop in the ocean, uh, hopefully a big drop, <laughs> but a drop in the ocean of the work that's being done on conversational AI uh, and language and uh, interfaces, right? Um, for instance, there's also amazing work on uh, on access AI that is the, that is transforming how you access and inter- interact with the system. Being done by Sarvam, which is a startup that uh, uh, you know uh, the former uh, co-founder of OpenAI, as well as the lead scientist and also co-founder of OpenAI, uh, have created um, uh, about six months back. And they are a, 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 a startup that has gone and already shown the promise of how uh, interfaces, Karen, will be transformed 
uh, th- thanks to AI. So I think that we are going to see so much change in how you engage with the internet, how you engage with information and services. But going forward, we're going to see uh, huge jumps in um, access, the access part of uh, of this. So I think uh, next, not next two, three years, next six months, next nine months, we're going to see uh, this, these innovations drop, you know, and transform uh, our understanding of what it means to access something. It's moving so quickly. What has been the role of partnerships in your success uh, with Jugal Bandi? Well, Jugal Bandi is entirely the consequence of co-creation, not just collaboration, but co-creation. I would say right from the get-go, we knew that no one organization had the capacity to build something like this. So how do you create the connective tissue for multiple organizations? In this case, the founding collaborators of the Open AI Mission uh, were uh, Agami, the organization that I represent because of our commitment to innovation in law and justice. Uh, Akestep, a leading nonprofit focused on uh, innovation in education, uh, ThoughtWorks, um, and of course, uh, the leading law school in the country, the National Law School of India University in Bangalore. And those are the co-collaborators and really everyone worked incredibly close together uh, to kind of make this happen and co-create it in the sense of uh, reimagining the vision, building, building things together, sharing knowledge and resources and really being one fluid team of teams. And subsequently, many other collaborators like Microsoft Research uh, has been an absolutely critical collaborator that has seen the potential of Jugalbandi and then said, let's make it really easy for people through something like Jugalbandi Studio, implement uh, these technologies at the touch of a button or in natural language using their uh, their own frameworks, you know. Uh, so uh, I think we've just seen it and, and Bhashini, the language mission, which is without which, how would the translations happen? So I think the degree of, and there are many others, to be honest, you know, the innovators themselves who've actually implemented the use cases, uh, some of them uh, particularly close to our hearts because some of the earliest implementations like Bandhu for migrant workers, but, and also uh, Civis in the uh, public consultation space, many, 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 Karen. Uh, the short answer to your question is the core innovation inside OpenAI is actually not the technology. The core innovation is what does it mean to create a co-creative mission? What does it mean for multiple people to hold a vision in their own distinct ways uh, and do their own special things, uh, you know, at the same time achieve that vision together? I would want to second that. And Karen, I do want to highlight, you know, when, when you know, in ThoughtWorks, when we say we want to do a project, we say we want to bring together a cross-functional team. Um, a partnership is just an elevation of that. You know, you've got partners who bring different skills, but then combined with a common purpose. Um, and... and um, the second point I would want to uh, sort of endorse what Sachin said. I think uh, our mission was very much there even before, you know, Gen AI became a fad. Um, it's just that with Gen AI, you know, we've been able to progress things much faster. We've been able to pull these things together. So I think that common purpose and mission has been very crucial um, for us to be able to take this forward. Yeah, if I can just add here, uh, you know, the work of uh, the early collaborators and some of the early data scientists, you know, from ThoughtWorks, uh, you know, was absolutely instrumental, you know, I'm not one for necessarily, you know, calling out individual people, but but they know who they are. And really, it's been many people who sort of stepped up and really been true co-founders of the mission, you know. Thank you, Sachin. So just wrapping things up here, looking ahead, what are your aspirations for the future of initiatives like Jugal Bandi and ILAP? And how do you envisage envisage them continuing to drive positive social change through AI-powered innovation? Uh, I think that goes to the heart of our mission. Really, really, what does it mean to have a mission that stands for open AI and justice? It means that there's another way of working. Uh, there's another way of working where we, we can collaborate, we can keep things open, we can share our resources, we can build powerful technologies that enable each other 
maybe we don't have everything in our hands. Maybe there's still going to be people who are going to be creating the best LLMs, you know. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff that can be kept open, can be shared. Uh, and if we can do this with innovators, as opposed to doing it in some walled garden somewhere, then we make ourselves domain relevant. We ensure that the use that those are real needs that we're addressing. And real issues of safety can be addressed. You can't do that inside a walled garden. But on the ground, you know what the safety issue is. Right. And that feedback travels right up to the collective. So really, Karen, it's about ensuring that we continue to operate as a collective. We have those uh, grassroots understanding and grass top understandings, continue to create, create the critical public technologies and uh, really build new culture in this space. I think this is what it's really about. It's really about a form of culture. Uh, and, and, you know, you might, uh, you can only see the importance of that when you compare it with uh, cultures which are, you know, monochromatic, where somebody is rolling out a product somewhere with the top AI, nobody knows what it is, and, you know, it's supposed to do great things. On the other hand, uh, when you have a culture, lots of people win, lots of needs are addressed, lots of feedback is taken. And I think that's what we want to see. Thank you. Vinod, is there anything you'd like to add to wrap this up? Uh, so, uh, again, completely endorse what Sachin said. I may be repeating this, but uh, ultimately it comes down to adoption. Um, you know, you've, you've got this platform. Uh, you want people to adopt. You want people to find use of it. Um, and you definitely do want to see if this goes not, you know, outside the borders of India as well. Uh, and the good news is um, we've had several inquiries. Um, you know, we had uh, some interest from the World Bank where we had demonstrated some countries have also come and seen this. So our aspirations are, um, you know, that it gets adopted. It, you know, people find it useful and, you know, it makes a real change to people's lives. And let me also say it's been a privilege to work with Agami. Um, we are a technology company, but we do have a heart. So, you know, it's, it's, it's great to work with a company like Agami to make some of this happen. At the same time, being a technology company to be able to hone our skills on some of the latest te technologies is just sort of the icing on the cake. So thanks a lot, Sachin, for this opportunity. Thank you. Well, um, thank you both so much, Sachin and Binod, for your time today. It's been truly interesting and um, inspirational to hear your story, and you both should be incredibly proud of, of what you're working on. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you.